Hi, this is Dr. Katie Bailey, and today we're going to be discussing vascular malformations. Our objectives, discuss the most common intracranular vascular malformations, review the Spetzler-Martin AVM grading scale. Arteriovenous malformations, or AVMs, are comprised of feeding arteries, anitis, which is a nest of vessels. This contains the shunting arterioles, which are the true culprit, and the interconnected venous loops, as well as the draining veins. The nidus is fed by one or more arteries and drained by one or more veins. Those feeding arteries are enlarged because of the increased flow and increased pressure, and you can get flow-related arterial aneurysms. You can also get flow-related venous aneurysms from the drainage. The AVM may contain dystrophic calcification, giving it a popcorn calcification appearance. There can be surrounding gliosis in the brain tissue, and it contains blood at different stages, depending on if the AVM has hemorrhaged or not. There are two types of nidises. There's the compact or glomerular nidus, and there is the diffuse or proliferative nidus. This is an example of an AVM showing it on the MRA. You can see flow coming to it from the PCA and the MCA. You can measure this nidus, so this would be considered a compact nidus. There's a little bit of gliosis in the tissue around it, as you can see on the flare image. More examples of AVMs. So here it is on another MRA. You see the vessel from the PCA supplying the nidus in the right occipital region. On CT, here are those coarse or popcorn calcifications within the nidus, and you can see some aneurysmal dilatation, usually of the venous outflow. On a T2-weighted image, you can see the flow voids of the nidus as well as the aneurysmal dilatation of the venous drainage, and this one has more gliosis and edema within the surrounding brain parenchyma. And here it is on a post-contrast sagittal T1 showing the nidus as well as aneurysmal dilation of that venous drainage. The Spetzler-Martin AVM grading scale gives a grade between one and five. Six is used to describe inoperable lesions, and this score correlates with operative outcome. So first you grade the size of the nidus, you measure it in all three dimensions, and it gets one point if it's less than three centimeters, two points, three to six, three points if it's greater than six centimeters. The next criteria is eloquence of the adjacent brain. So eloquent brain would include the sensory motor area, language areas, visual cortex, hypothalamus, thalamus, brainstem, cerebellar nuclei, or regions immediately adjacent to these structures. Whereas non-eloquent would include areas of the frontal lobe, temporal lobe that's not involved with language or memory, and the cerebellar hemispheres. So you get one point for eloquent, zero for non-eloquent. Venous drainage, if it's the superficial veins, it gets a zero. So those would be some of the cortical veins as opposed to the deep veins or draining directly into a dural venous sinus would get it a one. So you add up all these scores. This is an example of a low score AVM. Here is the nidus, it's in a cerebellar hemisphere. It measures less than three centimeters in maximum diameter and it is draining into a little cortical vein before it gets to the torcular. So this would be an AVM that could potentially be operated upon. And in this case it was. You can see the craniotomy defect in the occipital bone. You can see some encephalomalacia in that cerebellum, including the right cerebellar hemisphere and the vermis. And here's the clip that they used for the arterial supply and a little bit of air from that uh, craniotomy site a little bit of post-surgical air. Next we have the arteriovenous fistulas or AVFs. These are arteriovenous shunts from dural vessels. They could present variably with hemorrhage or venous hypertension and are most commonly located at the transverse slash sigmoid sinuses. Diagnosis on CT can be difficult, especially on a non-contrast CT, but should be thought of when hemorrhage is in an unusual location. In an older population, when you see hemorrhage along the tentorium, uh, cerebelli, you can think of possibly a tentorial dural AV fistula. With contrast, you can make the diagnosis. In this case, this was a dural AV fistula diagnosed on a non-contrast MRA of the head. You can see the connection between the artery going into the dural venous sinus. 
You can see abnormally enlarged and tortuous vessels in the subarachnoid space, especially if it's corresponding to a dilated cortical vein. You can get an enlarged external carotid artery or transosseous vessels. Uh, you can get abnormal dural venous sinuses, like this one, with arterialization of the sinus. On MRI, you can see those dilated peel vessels in the subarachnoid space, and you can see edema if there is some uh, retrograde venous drainage through those leptomeningeal branches, and this edema can enhance, telling you that there is more of an aggressive fistula. This is the same case that you see flow within the venous structures on the one side where there's that abnormal connection. This is an example of subarachnoid vessels. You see all these abnormal vessels along the ventral surface of the brain stem. Here it is on the T2, way too many flow voids. And here it is also on a more focused T2. You see too many vessels. This indicates some sort of abnormal arterial venous connection. Next, we have the cavernous malformation or cavernoma. These are slow flow venous malformations. They tend to be supertentorial, but can be anywhere. On CT, they can appear as a small area of hyperdensity, so hemorrhage has to be excluded. MRI, it shows this popcorn or berry appearance with a ream of signal loss due to hemosiderin. So what I tell my residents, I'd like to see areas within it of T1 signal that is hyperintense, T2 signal that is hyperintense, and a hypointense T2 signal rim. You need to have all of the features for this to be considered a cavernoma. There can be a little bit of enhancement. There can be a vessel going to the cavernoma, but you need to see some areas of hyperintense T1 signal centrally, hyperintense T2 signal centrally, and a peripheral hypointense T2 signal. There can be surrounding edema if there's been recent hemorrhage, and it shows up very dark on a hemosiderin sensitive sequence. So here are some cavernomas on MRI. So here you have that susceptibility artifact. Here's that hyperintensity on T1 centrally. On the post contrast, you can see it's even a little bit brighter. On T2, you have that bright T2 signal in the center and the hypointense T2 signal rim. Here's a more peripheral cavernoma, and this can be a cause of seizures in some patients because it disrupts cortical function. On CT, it just looks like a speck of hyperdensity. So this could easily be an intraparenchymal hemorrhage because you see it's hyperdense, it's within the parenchyma, there's a little bit of edema around it. It's much easier when you see this little popcorn calcification in it that you can suggest that it's possibly a cavernoma, but you really need the MRI to confirm. So here's that same one in the left frontal lobe. You can get a multiple cavernoma syndrome, which just means multiple cavernomas in the same patient. This patient is unfortunate. They have one in the pons, they have one in the occipital lobe, they have one in the frontal lobe. So this would just be a multiple cavernoma syndrome. So when you see one, look for two. Developmental venous anomalies or DVAs are congenital venous malformations which drain normal brain. They are the most common vascular malformations. It's described as a caput medusae sign. So you have a bunch of smaller little branches draining into this single draining vein. So when I look for these, I just look for any enhancement within the brain parenchyma. There should not be any enhancement, so you find it this kind of curvilinear vascular enhancement. Best seen on post-contrast imaging, although sometimes you can see them on just the T2 if they're larger. Last but not least, we have the capillary telangiectasia. It's a low flow vascular lesion within the brain, the second most common vascular anomaly. These are dilated capillaries interspersed with normal brain parenchyma. They're incidental. They can be found in the pons, the cerebellum, and the spinal cord, and it's characteristic of this stippled enhancement. Sometimes you can see it on the T2 weighted images. Sometimes you see nothing except for on the post contrast images. You get this blush with a kind of stripy appearance. That's when you think of capillary telangiectasia. These can be very confusing when you have a patient where you're ruling out metastatic disease and you see this enhancement. So just look for the characteristic appearance and thank you for your attention.